Thank you for tuning into the Boston Voice. I'm your boy Jeremy Flanagan. I'm bringing you guys another exclusive video did by none other than our TBV podcast team on this past Thursday. If you missed out on this interview, hey, he's been around for nearly 30 plus years. He's also been a chief editor for The Ring magazine. Now he's the analyst, expert analyst at that for Showtime's new boxing series, The Next Generation, and now he's been inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce to you all, please sit back, relax, and tune in to Steve Farhood. Monster, how you doing today? I'm doing very good, guys. I'm here with the one and only Steve Farhood. How you doing? Steve, we're doing great. We're doing great. Just want to thank you, obviously, for coming on the show, taking out the time to, you know, give us the opportunity to interview you, being a uh, inductee and all. You know, you're you're, you're a hot commodity these days. <laughs> I don't know. No different than I've been for the past 40 years, but uh, I uh, appreciate uh, you having me on. Thanks again for the time. I mean, 36 years is what I'm counting in this sport. You've, uh, I, you know... In preparation for the interview, I'm like, what accolades can I put here for Steve Farr? And, and, you know, you have, like, your own dot-com accomplishments page. You've done just about everything in this sport, from acting to commentating. I mean, uh, there happens to be no ceiling for you. We were speaking of ceilings with a couple of fighters earlier. I mean, um, what would you say is the highlight of Steve Farhood's career? Well, certainly going into the Hall of Fame in, uh, in June will be the highlight. I'm really looking forward to that. It's quite an honor. And it's validation because, you know, I've, I've been asked a million times, how come you just do boxing? Why don't you do football? Why don't you do baseball? Well, nobody wants to hear what I have to say about those sports because, you know, I've been in boxing the whole time. And I never thought I would do uh, be involved in one sport for 40 years, but I have been. And it's been time uh, well spent. And, and uh, you know, as a result, I would say, you know, the Hall of Fame is, is truly a great honor. Stephen, uh, this is Matt, the editor of The Boxing Voice. And very quickly, because you are often the, the ringside uh, scorer for the Showtime telecast, and a lot of fans, I think, are a little bit uh, uneducated or misinformed about the scoring criteria, can you briefly explain explain how you score a fight and how the judges score a fight? Great question. Sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's scoring. One, one thing in general about scoring is that a lot of writers and broadcasters don't like to admit or acknowledge that scoring is a very subjective thing. You know, you can have two guys who both know boxing or two women, whatever, who score <laughs> the same fight very differently. So there's a subjective factor that, uh, that a lot of people don't want to acknowledge. But the most important single factor in scoring a fight for me, and I do it both on Showbox and then for Showtime Championship Boxing, is focus. You have to be really concentrating to score a fight well. You can't let anything slip by. And, and that's, that's you know something that you don't hear too many TV broadcasters talk about. That's really important. But you know there are four points of scoring, uh, and the two most important ones, really the only two you have to really consider, Clean, effective punching and effective aggressiveness. Those, those two things are what you judge. And who did more damage? You know, and sometimes it's easy. And a lot of times it's not. And there are times where after three minutes, I look at, you know, I look at the page in front of me and I have to put a 10 in one column and a nine in the other column. And I'm not sure what to do, you know. So it, it's very difficult. Um, but with time, you know, you just try to be open-minded. You certainly don't favor one style over another. You don't favor one fighter over another. And every round is different from the one before it and the one after it. You have to consider each round individually. You don't judge a fight by 12 rounds or 10 rounds. You judge them one round at a time when you're scoring. So, you know, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. I'm not a trained judge, but I think I've been around long enough to, you know, present my score with, with a lot of confidence. And sometimes readers and people on Twitter agree with it. Sometimes they call me all kinds of names. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, St Steve, this, this is, is Boxing MD. Sorry about the background noise. Um, the the co-host, um, we, we recently saw that uh, Shakur Stevenson, right, who hasn't gotten um, – American boxing hasn't had Olympic success, obviously, for some time, Shakur being the most recent, signed with top rank. Do you mm -hmm. think that is the, um, the right. proper decision for a young fighter like him? I would never, ever tell a fighter not to sign with top rank, especially a young fighter. Um, 
Top Rank's been around longer than I have, and I'll tell you this. When it comes to developing young fighters, Top Rank is as good as, they, as there is. And the reason for that is they have excellent matchmakers. You know, there are, especially Bruce Trampler, who to me is the best matchmaker, you know, in existence. Um, so I think Shakur did a good thing. He was obviously a hot ticket. Uh, everybody wanted him, I'm sure. And uh, I think he did a very smart thing because Top Rank will move him at the right speed. And you can really derail a young fighter if you match him improperly. But they, they're really good at what they do. They'll make the right moves at the right time. They'll develop him into a, some kind of a local attraction. And uh, I think it's, it's a wise signing. Hey, Steve, how's it going? I'm uh, Steve Calderon, the producer here. So uh, you're in great company with this inductee class. Uh, people like Evander Holyfield, Johnny Tapia, and Marco Antonio Barrera. So what do you have to say about your fellow inductees? Well, all three of them were no-brainer first ballot Hall of Famers. Um, you know, uh, Evander, heck, I, I remember when he turned pro, he weighed 178 pounds. If you told me that night that he was going to be heavyweight champion of the world three times or however times he's won it, I would have said you're crazy. He's the ultimate overachiever for my money, and uh, he's been involved in some of the biggest fights in history. And, you know, Barrera and Tapia, both kings of the lighter weight classes, both the longtime champions, multi-division champions. Barrera will live forever with his rivalry with Morales, and Barrera was a great fighter as a boxer, a great fighter as a puncher. And, and Johnny Tapia, you know, working at Showtime, I have a soft spot for him. He was a wonderful guy, a tortured guy, but a wonderful guy big-hearted guy and a great, great fighter. And people forget how good he was because, you know, all the problems he had outside the ring with drugs and other things um, sometimes overshadowed how much Johnny accomplished in the ring. So, yeah, I definitely think I'm in uh, Barry Tompkins and I are in great company. And uh, and what I'm happy about more than anything is that Jimmy Lennon Jr.'s dad, Jimmy Lennon Sr., one of the great ring announcers of all time, I'm really glad he finally is getting inducted because he, he's deserved it for a long time. Steve, uh Casual oh, fan here. Steve Farhood, casual fan here. I want to bring it back to scoring because I'm the guy in front of the television that when we see your unofficial scorecards, I'm like, what? What is Steve Farhood talking about? Um, real <laughs> quick, <laughs> real quick. Um, Leo Santa Cruz, uh, Frampton Part Two. There was a tied scorecard there. Um, were you were you close to the tie, or were you like, how did you score that card? I definitely thought Santa Cruz deserved the decision. I had him ahead. Uh, I'm trying to remember my exact card. Maybe it was 15, 13 or 16, 12. I'm not sure. But no, I, I definitely think Santa Cruz controlled the tempo of the fight and, and deserved the fight. But one, one point I want to make, you, you know, you mentioned that, you know, when you're watching on TV, sometimes you'll say, what the heck is Farhood thinking? Keep in mind that when you're watching on TV, you're seeing a different perspective than I am ringside. Honestly. It's not necessarily a better or a worse perspective, but it's a different perspective. And, you know, there are times when I score a fight on TV and I go, what are the judges thinking? But then I realize I'm watching, you know, a whole different view of the fight than the guy who's sitting ringside. So that's something to think about also, because television obviously affects how we view what we're watching. Right. They're cutting cutting to different angles and we see better punching and missing punches as well. You're right. But uh, yeah, pleasure to talk to you, man. My Steve, pleasure. Steve, how you doing again? Um, so I want to switch things up. Um, I want to talk about the future, uh, which is the heavyweight division. It's been shooken up, and now it's exciting again. So many matches happening up, different promoters, different fighters all over the country. Something is happening all over the world. But there's a consistent debate as to who is the dominant heavyweight um obviously now with aj and Vladimir klitschko going into this fight we have to wait to see the outcome of that but i just want your educated guess the end of 2017 how do you see the heavyweight division looking and what has happened we're, we're you take us to december what has happened well, for starters, we got to look at Joshua Klitschko because the winner of that fight will clearly deserve to be the number one heavyweight in the world. For Klitschko, obviously, if he beats Joshua plus everything he's done before that, he would be back to number one. Joshua, if he beats Klitschko, you got to rate him a, a notch above Deontay Wilder because of, he, because of the win over Klitschko. So I think that eventually 
the odds are good that the two men left standing are going to be Wilder and Joshua. I don't think we'll see them fight this year, although you never know. I think Wilder would like that fight right away. But one thing to consider, boxing is a business. And while Joshua is a huge, huge star in England, big enough to draw 90,000 ticket sales for the Klitschko fight, he's not as well known in America. And I think he has to be sold here a little bit before he would consider, you know, the promoters would consider a fight with, with Wilder. So, and then the name, of course, we're leaving out is the guy who really deserves to be number one right now, and that's Tyson Fury. And he does deserve to be number one because he beat Vladimir Klitschko. And that's a win, as ugly as it was, that is more impressive than anything Wilder or Joshua has done. So where does Fury stand? I have no idea. He's obviously got out-of-the-ring problems. If he can come back, you add him to the mix, and I think the heavyweight division is in really good shape and will help carry the sport, which it hasn't done in a long time. So the end of 2017, if I had to guess where we'd be, I'd say Wilder and Joshua on top. Fury is too much of a wild card to predict. And hopefully in 2018, I'd love to see Wilder and Joshua in like a, in a really big, big, big super fight. That would be tremendous. Two guys who can really punch, two big heavyweights, one British, one American. I think it would be fantastic. So that's, that's where I, I see boxing, and I hope, uh, I hope I'm right. Uh, Steve, this is MD again. Um... I vote. I got a question about, um, I guess, the image of boxing. Right? We, I always like, I guess, laugh sometimes when, um, even on like networks like Showtime, when boxers say things that may be foul, you know, drop an f bomb, say something that some people might think is borderline uh, racist or insensitive. Right? And there's so much, I guess, stress mm -hmm. to police what the boxers are saying, which we all know um, that the sport is built upon people being themselves and being um, dramatic and these guys are in the ring and potentially could, you know, kill each other. Right. We both, I, I met you, um, right. I actually saw you at the Pritchard Cologne fight. Um, and, and you know, this is a very dangerous sport. So why is boxing so, um, focused sometimes to clean up the, the things that aren't even in my opinion, the most dirty. Well, boxing has always had a lot of problems and a lot of the problems boxing has, it causes itself. Um, but in terms of cleaning it up, yeah, I, I kind of agree with you. There are limits. Now, when Angel Garcia went off at the uh, press conference before, you know, for announcing the Thurman fight, uh, he painted a picture that, that was just incredibly ugly about boxing. So, um, Steve, sorry to interrupt. Can I give you a better example? Adrian Broner on your network, Sam. I'm sorry. Can I give you Adrian Broner on? Also, of course. Well, no, but he just said, right, I'll give you the quote. He just goes, I just beat, you know, I'm a can man. I fight an African, Mexican. I just beat the fuck out of a Mexican, right? And immediately, Showtime Network, um, um, I think it was Jim Gray, obviously, was saying, Adrian, you cannot say that, insinuating that it was a racist thing or whatever it was, right? That's a, kind of what I'm saying. Like, obviously, Angel Garcia went way overboard, but, like, it's just the whole image. Yeah. Like, do you, do you see what I'm, where I'm coming from? I, I see where you're coming from, but let me explain one, one way to look at it. And I think it's a proper way to look at it. Boxing is a business. As a business, it needs corporate sponsorship. One of the reasons boxing is not baseball, football, or basketball is because it doesn't have a lot of corporate sponsorship. How many times do you see fighters in commercials, national TV commercials? Almost never. How, how many corporate corporations are, are involved in the support, the economic support of boxing? Almost none. When you have people like Angel Garcia or Broner or Tyson Fury, name who you want, talking like that, well, there's a price to pay for that. You're not going to have corporate sponsorship. Corporate America is going to turn its back on boxing. It has done that a long time ago, and that's no good. You can't have a, a big, healthy, a growing sport if you don't have corporate America behind you. Look at the sports that are most successful. The NFL, NASCAR made a big move years ago. They all did it on the back of corporate America. And if you don't have that support, you can't be a rich and thriving sport. So that's why in, in, in those instances with those fighters, you can't really have those guys saying what they're saying on TV. It's bad for the sport. It's bad for the image, and image does count. Steve, uh, you know, you've been in the sport for a very, very long time. Is What has been the biggest cultural shift in boxing since you started working in boxing to now? Well, the biggest cultural shift for sure is the globalization of boxing. Um, you know, if you picked up the Ring Magazine or KO Magazine, which I started in 1980, and you looked at the ratings, 
all you saw was American fighters for the most part, except for the lighter weight classes, you know, the straw weights and the, and the light flies and the flies were always dominated by fighters from Thailand and Asia and Mexico and other places. But the, the bigger divisions were all American. Now you have as many British world champions right now as you do Americans. That was, that would have been unheard of when I first started in the sport. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest fighter in America for years and years, or one of the two biggest, wasn't even an American. It was Manny Pacquiao, born in the Philippines, lived in the Philippines. So the globalization of boxing, you know, right now we have a heavyweight champion in Anthony Joshua, who's huge in England, and uh, could very well end up controlling the, 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 the sport and, and be the biggest star in the game. It's possible to happen. So I think that's the biggest change culturally, is that the, the sport, it belongs to the world now, and America is not as dominant. And if you want, you can draw a parallel to perhaps the rest of the world. You know, it's a global economy. And America doesn't control everything anymore as it once did, much more so. So I think that's the biggest change in, in, my, uh, in my 40 years. Steve, so March 4th weekend, are you going to be at the Barclays Center? Yes, I am. I will definitely be there. Looking forward to it. It's only a cab ride from my apartment. <laughs> so I like it for that reason too. But I will definitely be there, and that is a that is a great fight. That's on CBS, so a lot you know, a huge audience will see it. And uh, just two fighters in their prime, both undefeated, both champions. What more can you ask for? Now, are you going to be the unofficial scorecard, or are you just coming as a fan? Oh no, I'll be working the show for CBS. Yeah, I'll be the unofficial scorer, and uh, I don't think we'll be doing a show before that the way we often do with. Uh, Showtime Championship Boxing. You know, we always do the show extremes. I don't think there'll be one for that show, but uh, I will. I look forward to doing the scoring, and I'll, I'll be concentrating hard because that's going to be it's going to be a great fight. Well, I, I want your breakdown of that, but before that, um, I, I'll just remind you: we've had you on this show before, you and Al, actually at the same time, and you've given us some of your, uh, you know, I guess road stories when you shared hotels and things together. So um, you've always sounded like a great guy. Every time I see you at the fights, you're a great guy. We're having this function the day before. And speaking of Deontay Wilder, he'll be there. So it would be a pleasure if you could come through. I'll have Anna give you all the details. Um, but if you're going to be in New York, which you live there, it would be a pleasure to have you. Um, it's an appreciation to our listeners that actually listen to this show. And this year... They're coming out for this Danny Garcia Thurman fight. Everyone is excited. I mean, we have some listeners coming from Africa, three from the United Kingdom, about five from Toronto. I mean, Danny and Thurman are big, but Thurman is a two and a half favorite. Um, can you at least tell us why people should be betting on Danny? I mean, he's looked so bad in the past. Right now, with the fans, at least, in social media, they have him clearly losing to Keith Thurman. Are they right? Right. Yeah, Thurman is the favorite, and I think the main reason for that is that Thurman is much more established at the weight, as a welterweight. Danny Garcia's only had a couple of fights at welterweight, as a full welterweight. Um, Danny Garcia, if you want an excuse to pick Danny Garcia or to bet on Danny Garcia, getting, getting two to one odds, this is what I would tell you. He was a big underdog against Amir Khan, three to one underdog. He knocked him out. He was a big underdog against Lucas Vitesse, four to one. He beat him. So in the two biggest fights, probably in Danny Garcia's life, he's been an underdog and he's won. He has a great chin. He's never been down. Uh, Keith Thurman also has a great chin. He's only been down once. So it, it, you know, two to one odds is, is fair. I understand why Thurman is favored, but boy, don't go to sleep on Danny Garcia because he's been an underdog before and he always seems to raise his game. And uh, I'm sure, you know, he's going to fight as well as he can that night. I, I think both guys will be primed for, for fantastic performances. Steve, casual fan again. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you something about that, um, being that you have to score. I, I wanted to know, because I, again, the guy in front of the television scoring, I'm looking at this fight, and I am picking a, a, a fighter. Like, Danny Garcia might be my fighter, right, that night, and I want to be bi unbiased. And... You know, Keith Thurman may do three mm -hmm. things and Danny does four things and I will just give it to Danny. And, and what I mean by four things is meaning like he may probably control or throw um, towards the end of the round, like an effective power punch. And I will give it to Danny. How, mm -hmm. how, how do you separate your liking Keith Thurman as the favorite and scoring 
you know, Danny around. Basically, well, how do you score, you, a, you score a fight? Yeah, how do you how do you put it aside? I mean, yeah, how do you put it aside and not be biased? Well, it's not. It's not, not like you're picking Thurman. It's not difficult. It's not difficult. I'm not picking anybody. I don't pick publicly, and that's the reason I don't pick because I score the fights. When I was an editor at the magazine, I could predict all I wanted. Sometimes I got it right. Sometimes I didn't. But I don't predict fights uh, publicly because because I score. But as far as the challenge of being unbiased. That's very easy for me, for one simple reason. I really legitimately don't care who wins, uh -huh. you know, in, in any fight. I'm, I'm looking at it professionally. I'm looking at it from a professional standpoint. Am I a fan of boxing? Yes. Are there certain fighters that personally maybe I like a little more than others? Of course. I'm human. There's no different, I'm no different than anybody else. But in terms of winning and losing, when that bell rings, I, I don't really, it doesn't really affect me who wins or loses. I don't care. And it's better to think that way because it allows me to be unbiased. So it's not really hard to be unbiased at all. And that's the difference between a fan and a professional. A fan doesn't have to be unbiased. A fan can root for who he wants to root for. He has every right to do that. But when you're in the business and you're getting paid to do a job, it becomes a job. It's, it's your career. It's your job and it's your reputation. So you have to look at it a little differently than a fan does. I totally get it. I, I just wanted to hear your, your, your answer. Thank sure. You. Yeah, sure. Steve, Steve, that's free advice to the panel, right? The people who often on the panel uh, pick with emotion. You know, you're telling them to essentially take their emotions out of what they really do know when they watch boxing. And that's as obviously as a professional yourself, that's what you do when you score. That's kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I have opinions on that fight and, and, and I, you know, I could pick a winner, but I'm not going to do it because I don't think it's professional to score the fight. And, uh, and I know Al Bernstein agrees with me. Al very rarely takes a winner of a fight before, beforehand, um, you know, because for the same reason. He's going on TV to talk about it, and he doesn't want to be perceived as thinking one guy, you know, is, is ahead of the other guy before the fight starts. So, um, but that's basically it, yeah. And, and other writers do pu pick publicly, like Dan Rayfield. In his chat, he'll, he'll tell you who he's picking, and that's fine. You know, that's, that's cool. I mean, Dan is a professional and a very, very unbiased guy as well, so... Uh, there's two ways you can go about it. This is just the way uh, Al and I choose to be. Steve, when you and Al Bernstein get together behind closed doors, you know, no business, just talking boxing, chopping it up, talking shop. You guys pick on the on the down low. You pick. Like, yeah, <laughs> going to win. On the down low between each other, not publicly to each other. Have you done that? Well, you know, you might be surprised, but we don't talk about boxing that much. We talk about broadcasting a lot. You know, and about how boxing is shown on television. Because remember, that's our business. You right. know, we, we, we're talking about boxing, but we're on television. We're part of a television broadcast. So we talk about announcers and we talk about, you know, how the show went and, you know, that kind of stuff. Because we both understand the show is not about us. Nobody watches boxing for the announcers. They watch it for the fights. But that doesn't mean that we don't take our jobs very seriously. And it's our job to make the viewer either a little bit more informed or a little bit more entertained. So we talk a lot more about broadcasting than we probably do about boxing. Well, Steve, I want to thank you again for giving us the time. And I want to correct you. Our listeners around here definitely talk about the commentators a lot more than you think. You may think that they're not, uh, <laughs> that you guys are not important, but they are. They, they consistently compare Showtime to HBO and there's always dream calls because this we take live calls. So sometimes people will call in and, and, and they'll want to see, you know, maybe Al and Kellerman call a fight, you know, things that we haven't been able to see. So right. believe me, people talk about you more than you think. You guys are synonymous with the sport. Thank you again for coming on. Give out your social media here for anyone crazy enough not to be following you already. And, uh, you know, best of luck, obviously, March 4th. I want to see a great uh, Steve Farhood scorecard for Danny Garcia. <laughs> And March third, hopefully you well, should. We'll see about that. <laughs> it, get it. But in the meantime, in the meantime, make sure everybody watches Showbox. Showbox tomorrow night, ten o'clock Eastern. Where I'm in Oklahoma right now, ready to go. Congratulations. All right, Steve. Thank you again, Monster. Thanks for Peace. having me on, guys. No yeah. problem, Monster. Peace. Thank, thank you. Guys. All right.